record anyway. Okay, welcome everybody uh, to this evening's webinar, we, uh, Coaching Within the Rules webinar. We hope you're all looking forward to this webinar. I am. My name is William Harmon. I'm National Dream Doctor League Football, and my remit is specifically coach education. And I'm joined by my colleague, the mighty Claire Dowdall. Claire, do you want to say hello? Hello, folks. Uh, I'm a National Development Officer as well, and my remit is actually referee education. So, uh, no, so there's a nice... Is it, is it, yeah, there's a nice mixture there, isn't there? Nice mixture. So there's a Kerry accent and an Antrim accent, and now we have a coaching view, and they've got a referee's view. So it's fantastic to see. So look, the webinar won't be more. I don't think it'll be any more than 70 minutes, Claire. I don't think it'll be uh, that long. It all depends on our discussion. And throughout the night, guys, if you want to ask questions throughout the night, please throw it in the chat function. We'll do our best, whether it be a Claire or myself, to answer you on the chat, or we'll answer you live on the actual webinar. But uh, as I said, guys, make sure it will be put all panelists and attendees so everybody sees uh, the question that you're asking and obviously then the answer as well. If you can't hear us, then just leave the webinar and come back in and we'll take it from there. So we we'll move it on. So what are we about tonight, Claire? Our outcomes by the end of the webinar, we will explore the relationship between playing rules and the impact in coaching. And what does that synergy look like? Um, we state the rule and govern that governs the tattle, deliberate uh, high tattle late football as well. We'll look at that, but we just to let you know, we've done a webinar specifically on the tattle, specifically on the high tattle and also charging stuff. So please, over the coming weeks, give a look at that. And if anybody, anybody has watched that, if you want to share your comments on the chat function, do hope you enjoyed it. And we we'll look at those red, red, yellow cards, non-tactical and tactical fouls, and we'll try and get more clarity around that. I think Claire, we like. I think it's safe to say within an hour, we're not going to know the, all the rules within an hour, but hopefully we have a better, a, a small bit of a better understanding. I think that's what we're going after, really. You know. So what are we going after ultimately? And I, I, John, I suppose I, we always hear this, we always have this word consistency, consistency in messaging uh, and delivery. So. To get consistency, we need to know the detail. We need to know uh, more about the game. And we need to get more clarity around the rules of the game. So the detail, Claire, obviously is in our, in our rule booklet. And there's, you know, on our website, you can access that rule booklet. And there's also a coaches one, that's a, a kind of a, a pocket-sized rule booklet that you can access, which goes through in detail the rules. So I would say every coach here tonight, from a coaching perspective, get your hands on that. Print it off the website. Make sure you have that because that's where the detail is if you want to know uh, if there's any discrepancies in the rules. Then clarity. So you're here tonight. You're here tonight to get a bit more clarity on certain rules. And hopefully we'll, we'll cover the majority. But if we don't, put the chat function. We'll do our best to answer those. So you're now here to get clarity. It's like going to the rules refresher workshops. It's like going to the, our coach education workshops, our referee education workshops. You're trying to get more clarity around certain rules, which then would allow flow of the game and allow consistency. And I suppose, Claire... We have this, you know, thing, oh, the referee need to know the rules of the game. And it's the referees you should be talking to. And I know you're doing massive work with the referees in relation to this area. You want, do you want to share just kind of a, a, what you do on an annual base with the referees, Claire? Yeah, all our referees now, it actually was in the past at Congress that you can't referee an adult game without doing a referee's refresher. So that's where we're trying to bring the education and the consistency together. So, you know, we, we trained over a thousand referees this year during lockdown, William, all the same course, all the same material, all across Ireland. So they're hopefully getting the same message um, that we'll be delivering to use as coaches and players night to night. So it's and really trying to bridge that gap. And that has been a real kind of positive of COVID, hasn't it, Claire? Do you know, like, yeah. you know, referees, we've been able to get that message out to loads of people, coaches and referees, in terms of the, a clear message in terms of the coaching and also in refereeing and the rules. And it is, I think COVID has really given us that avenue to do that, Claire, where probably we would have done this in live workshops before face-to-face. -face. Now we can get our message out there a lot more. So, and everybody's a role, guys. Whether you're a coach here tonight or you may be a referee here tonight, you know, we all have a role. There's no point... I suppose, worrying about the uncontrollable, what the referee does, and vice versa, the referee's worrying what the coaches do. Let's all, I suppose, control what we can control. So it's my job as a, as a coach on the field of play to coach the girls within the rules of the game. That's my job. That's my role. Now, I may have opinions on the rule, but the opinions doesn't matter because at the end of the day, the rules are there in the story. My opinion doesn't matter. And I, the same applies for the referees. It's not about opinions, it's about what the rule is and applying the rule. So everybody's a role to play. And I would always say, don't give out about something unless you're 100% sure yourself of the rule. I think that's a good one, Claire, because we always hear this, oh, Jesus, the coaches are the problem. Oh, referees are the problem. 
And then when we ask themselves what the rule is, they can't, they can't answer it. So I always say, don't say something unless you're 100% sure yourself of the rule. I don't know if you mean to say that, Claire. I, th- I think that would help. But unfortunately, the problem is people say stuff without knowing the rules, William. That's where we run into. <laughs> that's it. That's it. Should we all know? Should we all? Should we all yeah. know the, the answer? Should we? Everybody knows everything. Sure. That's how it works. Okay. Now, let's have a black card. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We're going to have a game tonight. So if you, have a, if you have a piece of paper, everyone, have a piece of paper. And just, you know, as you go down, I, we're going to go through 16 rules here. And we'll, we, Claire will give the, the, the referee angle and I'll give the coaching angle where possible. And if you have any questions, just ask in the chat function. And we want you to mark how many rules you get right. So hopefully you get 16 rules right. And I think Claire has a special prize for someone. Yeah. You get 16 rules right in a row. You get a special prize now. And that's clear. Claire's going to send it out. Yeah, so what is that, Claire? I wonder what it is. So it's log your fun. score and see how you get on. And then, I suppose, as we go along, we'll identify the key pertinent points in those rules. Okay, and we'll take it from there. So let's have a bit of fun with this, everyone. You know, it's a lovely evening out there. You know, you're, it's what, three to nine. Um, let's have a bit of fun with this uh, and, and see how we get on. Okay. Okay, Claire. Rule number one. Rule one, folks. So we're going to be using polls. So I'm going to stick the poll up in a second and you can click away your answer. Everyone just clicks in. So the rule number one, what we're asking is a player while in possession of the ball is knocked to the ground. She loses possession of the ball, but manages to fist the ball into the net for a goal whilst on the ground. Should this score stand? Yes or no? And the poll is up there, folks. Yeah, so in the poll, guys, give your answers. Everybody now answer. So should the goal stand? Ooh, very interesting. <laughs> I think your, your, your prize is safe for a while, I'd say, Claire. Yeah. <laughs> it's very interesting to see. Very it's, even. <laughs> you know, so we, th- we, you know, everybody, we said we start with an easy one, but maybe, 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 maybe we didn't. That's okay. Um, so I think we have a few There's more. There's a few more. Yeah. yeah. We're and doing we the last couple. And we'll issue the results to everyone. Uh, and Claire, you can just give it per, uh, your, uh, your, you can let me know when to move it on and I'll give the answer. I'm moving on now, I will, I think, because that's uh, we're nearly 22 out of the 26. So, uh, the answer is yes. So any player, okay, Claire, what's your thoughts on that one? So the answer is yes. So 10 people got it wrong. So, oh, oops. <laughs> Claire, what's your thoughts on that? And from, a, uh, I suppose, from a rules perspective. From the rules perspective, there's a couple of things. Well, the first thing is when the player's on the ground, they have every right to play it away from themselves. If they had brought it in, it would have been a free. But as the fall, they're allowed to play it away. And that's stri- strike an action away. If it goes into the goal, the goal actually stands. And, and that is the rule on that. That's actually a rule book in the official guide. Any player who falls or is knocked to the ground whilst in possession of the ball may fist or pan the ball on the ground and may score by doing so. But it's important, it, as long as it's away, from the body and um, it stands as a score. I think that's very interesting. So from a coaching's perspective, obviously if she's on the ground and both knees are on the ground, she brings the ball into her body. It's, it's obviously, it's a free because her, her knees are on the ground. So obviously the rule states you both knees must be off the ground in order to pick up the ball. From a coaching perspective, I'd love to throw it out to coaches there. Now that we know this rule, do we practice this in our sessions? I actually think about this, you know, when I was planning for this, Claire, and I'm going to be very honest, you know, it only came into my head when I was actually going through this. Do we practice players you know, winning the ball, maybe fumbling to the ground and hitting it along the ground? Do we practice that in our sessions? So whereby what ball wins the ball, they probably fall to their knees to the ground and slap the ball along the ground. You know, so it's actually a skill in itself to do that. But also... Being, players being aware of the rule is very important. Like, guys, when you do fall to the ground, you can hit the ball away from you, but you can't bring the ball into possession. So I think from a coaching perspective, that's very important. You can actually even practice that in sessions. I don't care what your thoughts are before we go to the next one. Yeah, no, that, that's it. It's just the lack of knowledge out there, Will, that they can actually play it on the ground. And if you stumble and fall, push it on, push it on. Yeah. Because there could be a goal opportunity there. Very good. So we go to number two. So 50%, guys, keep in there. Stay positive. There's 15 more questions. You can do it. As for the other 50%, well done. You're in for Claire's prize now. You're in for Claire's prize. Okay, here we go. Rule number two. Off we go, Claire. Okay, so rule number two. What is the correct rule regarding a kick out after a wide ball at adult level? So this is after a wide. Is it A, the keeper kicks out the ball from the 20 meter line directly in front of the goal post? All players must be 13 metres from the ball and outside the 20 metre line until it is kicked. 
The ball must cross the 20 meter line before anyone except the kicker can touch it. Or is it B, guys? Is it B? The kicker kicks the ball from the 30 meter line in, in, directly in front of the goalposts. All players must be 13 meters from the ball and outside the 20 meter line until it's kicked. The ball must cross the 20 meter line before anybody except the kicker can touch it. Clear. And C, or is it the keeper kicks out the ball from the 13 meter line? Directly in front of the goalposts, all players must be 20 metre from the ball and outside 13 metre line until it's kicked. The ball must cross the 20 metre line before anyone except the kicker can touch it. So but how is the way, poll going? So let me know, uh, Claire Dowell, how is that poll going? We've two answers in already and uh, we're sort of in between once again, Will. I know, guys, so read that, read the question. You're the coaches, guys. If your coach is here tonight, you should know this rule with the back of your hand because obviously the kickout is vitally important. So it's very interesting. I know Claire did this deliberately now, everyone. This is probably the longest ones because she wanted to confuse you in terms of you should know the question. You should only answer in five seconds. <laughs> but uh, Claire, you can let me know when to move it on and hopefully that people are coming with the right answers. People must still be reading away, Will. So with about 15 answers so far. I'm torturing them. Yeah, um, good stuff. Maybe the ones who didn't get the first one right are nervous about this one. Don't be nervous, guys. Go for it. Uh, there's only two options, right or right or wrong. So just go I, for it. I think my money's safe again, Will, and my prize. <laughs> well, I'm going to give you the last 10 seconds, folks, for anybody yeah. else that wants to contribute. Excellent. 10 seconds. 21 out of 25 there. Don't worry, guys. We don't know who's uh, who's actually voting. So nope. it's, all, it's all anonymous. We don't know who's voting. We don't know who's right or wrong. So um, don't be worried about that. So there's the results. You'll probably see, be able to see them now. Well, oh my God! So it's a third, a third, a third. So yep. third, yeah, it's very interesting. So guys, a third of you are right. Um, this is interesting. I, I love doing the rules because you know what? Um, it's it always it's always learning. You're always learning. So here's the answer, guys, and the answer is. B. B. So, Claire, what, can you give it maybe one or two pertinent points to the coaches or if there's referees on tonight? What's, what's, what's important to note here? The biggest one is that it's a wide ball, so it's kicked from the 13-metre line. And, 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 and all the rules said it's directly in front of the goals, which a lot of people don't actually know, but that's where it's supposed to be kicked from. So it has to be in front of the goals, Claire. So, yep. okay, so that's very interesting as a coach to know that as well in terms of uh, in their coaching. Um, and travelling the ball, the travel must travel? 20 metre line. That's the travel. biggest bit. Well, you know, the amount of people that step across that 20 metre line in before the ball has. And if a player, if it's an attacker or a defender, touches it within that, it's a free either yeah, way. Either way. So, it's really, that's the biggest one. If you look there, it's 20 meter line and 13 meters away. So there's quite a bit to work out if you're um, a coach with your goalkeeper and oh, with your team on kickouts. Exactly. And just a few things there, guys. 13 meters away. So from the point of kicking the ball, they must be 13 meters away. That's vitally important. But also too, guys, in this one, the goalkeeper, am I right in St. Clair? So if the goalkeeper kicks the ball and it doesn't go over the 20 meter line, she can go and kick it again once she doesn't yep. bring it into her position. Am I right in saying that? Yeah. So she can kick it along the ground again, well, as long as she doesn't take it up into your hands. Yeah. So like if she kicks it and it doesn't hit past the 20 meter line, it say it falls short at 18 meters. Nobody else can come in and touch that to keep her right to run out the field and put her foot to that again um, and kick it right or left or straight up the middle. And how many keepers know that? You know what I mean? Like how many keepers know that and no players can come in inside a 20 metre line and pick it up because it's a free either way. So the goal can go run out again and kick it again. And if you're playing against a, a, a strong wind and you're playing a sharp kick out, you know, that's something to know. Um, from a coaching perspective, I would say to any coaches here tonight, if you're doing any kick-out strategies or any kick-out patterns, it's vitally important you know the rules. So this one and the next one, it's very important as a coach you know the rules because if you're going to try and do a kick-out pattern, say, for example, shark kick-outs, you know, it's vitally important you know the rules, then you apply the pattern. Um, so I always say if you're, if you're applying patterns of play in particular goalkeeping ones, uh, it's very important that you know the rules. So well done. Thanks, Claire. That, that's excellent. Excellent. Well done. Okay, third one, rule three. Here we go. Um, let's, let's see how we get on here. So, so what is the penalty if a kick out is received by a player inside the 20 meter line after the wide ball? So we kind of answered that already. So hopefully, yeah. <laughs> geez, guys, everyone, you got to get this one right. Is it a free to the opposing team on the 13 meter line opposite to where the foul occurred? Is it a throw ball or is it a free to the opposing team on the 20 meter line opposite to where the foul occurred? So our discussion eliminates one anyway. 
I think our discussion in, in the previous one eliminates one of them. So which one is it, guys? Um, is it A or C? Because I think our discussion eliminated the throw ball. So let's see how we get on. Or Joe, I should have said nothing because they might have picked. They might yeah, have well, picked could have, somebody could have picked the throw ball there. Yeah, 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 yeah. You can let me know. Uh, guys, if you need questions on any of these rules, please, guys, in the chat function, throw them in there. We'd be happy to answer them as we go along. So, okay, you can let me know when to... Yeah, we, we've only... We're 14, 15 marked in now. They're coming along now nice and quickly, Well, Good stuff, yeah. You'd be disappointed, though. We still don't have 100%. <laughs> uh, listen, hi, that's, that's the way it goes. You know, that's the way it goes. Uh, I'm going to give them another 10 seconds and then I'm going to head it off. Perfect. Yeah, spot on. So is it A, B, or C? So you can see the results there, Will. Well, it's good to know everybody that no one picked B. You know, it's, it's, that's great. You're listening to us. So the majority, 84%, say it's C, uh, Claire. And so let's see, let's see what the story is here. Let's see what the answer is. And the answer is C. Well done. Well done, everyone. So from a... I suppose we kind of answer that, but is there anything else yeah. you'd like to raise here, Claire, on that one? I just think the understanding of the 20 meter line is really the highlight for me from a coaching and a refereeing perspective. You have to teach your players that you have to stay outside that until the ball passes. And if you can get it really put into them and work it into your work, your kick out strategies, and with your goalkeeper, you're, you're going to go far. Exactly. I, I go back to my point I made earlier on. If you're applying, like Claire says, a football pattern or a kick-out strategy, it's vitally important your players know the rule, so therefore you can implement that successfully. So, well done. Okay, we're moving on. Rule four. Um, do you want me to play the video here? I'll play it. Let's, let's see it. And Claire, you can talk over it while I play it. Yeah. Um, just take so the sound over. We have this. and uh, It's a kick from the 45-meter line. And the question that I'm going to put up to ask you is, what is this worth? So what in the poll, worth? it's going to ask you, is it worth the one point, two point, or three points if it goes directly over the bar, which you can just see from the video clip there. So she strikes it beautifully, and it goes directly over the bar. Is it a one, two, or three points? And while people are coming in there, Claire, I've heard so many times during the summer, I've yet to see a ladies football kick a free from a 45. Well, here. And there's also a very good way in, in Waterford. I'm right in saying uh, there's a Waterford that pops over the bar handy as well from 45. So, uh, you know, it's, it can be done. I, I'll, I'll explain that from a coaching perspective in a minute. So what is the score? What is it? I wonder if they're coming in, Claire. What is the score? Yeah, there's loads coming in now at the minute, Well. Um... Uh, so they're, they're, I'm all, going they're to, all getting comfortable now, Claire. They're getting comfortable now. <laughs> so we really get a full house of answers. 20, 23 out of twenty four have answered us. So all, uh, they're all they're all pretty confident. Good stuff. Uh, I think, and and you'll see from it. Uh, okay, though. But it's very interesting. Fifty seven percent of the group tonight feel it's one point, and forty three thinks it's two points. So this is very interesting, guys. I, I'm, I'm learning very, I, I'm, do you know why? I always want to be a showtime host, so I'm really enjoying tonight. So uh, let's go to the next one. So the answer is, it's two points. But I suppose, what are the pertinent points from a rules perspective? And I suppose we could have a lot of coaches here that are underage, Claire. So is there a difference? So what, what's the pertinent points here, Claire? Yeah, well, it's actually, this is a great, it actually shows me that we haven't really got our message fully out there when I see that type of number, so it always brings me back down to earth. This was a rule change in Congress um, to make it two points in 2019, so it's ineffective just over a year at this point. Um, it's like normal, if you're under 14 level, you have the choice to kick the ball from your hands or off the ground. If you decide to kick it from your hands, it's only ever worth one point. Um, from under 14 upwards, if you kick it off the ground, it has to be off the ground and it goes over the bar, it's worth two points. What's really interesting, and, and I have to note it here, is, well, if it actually touches a defender and it still goes over the bar, it's still worth two points. Okay, and that's that's interesting that it goes directly over, or if your defender tries to get it, but they hit it over, it's still two points. So If it hits an attacker, it's worth one. Yeah, so under 15 up, so clear, it's, it's two points it applies. Obviously, because underage, you can hit it off the hands or from the ground. Just while we're here on that one, Claire, if the ball is, is, is fouled, the 45 is fouled, and it's bought in 13 metres, does, it, does the two points still apply if she kicks over the bar off the ground? It sure does, Well, and that, that's a big change made on it. People wouldn't realise that. So if, if somebody, if I'm going to head up and take the 45 and you mouth back to the referee or you don't move back when you're, you're supposed to, the referee has every right to bring that forward 13 metres. So, so now you have a, 
30, 32 meter kick off the ground. And if she clips that off the ground and over the bar, it's still worth the two points. Wow. From a coaching perspective, coaches, it's a skill. Let's practice it. Let's not wait till we get to the, the age group whereby you know, kicking over the bar is two points. Let's get our players practicing off the ground. Kicking off the ground, it's a skill. It's gone out of the game because of obviously a lot of freeze now are off the hand. You can take them off the hand. Goalkeepers can kick them off the hand. So I would advocate strongly from a coaching perspective. You now know that if you've got a good free taker off the ground, if you start practicing that, it could be a massive benefit. It could be the point that could win you a game. So I would say from a coaching perspective, guys, it's a skill. Always was a skill to be the ability to kick off the ground. But now look at that. Look at the girl from, from, from Kerry. Popped over the bar, two points, valuable score on that day. So it's vitally important we as coaches are aware of this, but start practice that and that, practicing that in, in, your, in your sessions. You can have a bit of fun. At the end of the, at the, end of the sessions, you can say, right, guys, I've laid out three cones. Who can kick the ball off the ground over the bar? Come on. You know, so if you kick it over the bar, you have three attempts. If you don't get in three attempts, you're out of the game. So again, it's just practicing, having fun with it. But I would definitely advocate it's a skill that needs to be practiced more because now of the reward of kicking it directly over the bar. Um, okay, Claire, we move on to, to, to rule five. Um, let's go. Let's see how we get on. Yeah, I think you might have spoiled this one as well, though. But I'll say nothing. Should an opposing player interfere with the taking of a 45 meter kick? What should the referee do? Is it a retake? Is it a throw in? Or is it award the 45 meter kick 13 meters near to the defending goal? So, guys, if you're listening to the conversation, if you are listening to us, you can answer this one. Um, but if you're not listening to us, then maybe, maybe we're not maybe engaging the, the audience at all, Claire. So, okay, it's interesting. Um, we still have a few more to come in. Um, so what is it if, if, if an opposition foul the ball is boring 30 meters? Okay, what happens? And the answer yeah. is? Nearly everybody's listening to as well. Nearly everybody. Nearly everyone. Okay, nearly everyone, guys. So as Claire outlined in the previous, it's C, guys. It's C. So should an opposing player foul the 40 meter kick on a regulation uh, pitch size, the 40 meter kick is bought in 30 meters. And that's, that's it. And the two points being awarded for that is, is it's just very interesting, Claire. Do you know? It can be the winning and losing up a game, William. If you have a tight game and it's one of the last kicks and you're messing around and it's moved forward 13 metres, like it's very scorable and, and it's worth two points. It can be a huge score in any game. So uh, I would be emphasising for all the coaches to get practice and actually kicking 45s. But also from a coaching perspective, I suppose, Claire, the importance of, of our players being disciplined and not doing anything silly or, you know, the, the clapping, the waving, the hands. I won't, I won't go too far into that because that question's coming up as well. But, you know, just being disciplined, really. You know, that, you know, this could be the scenario 15, 13 metres brought up. It could lead to two points. So the importance of coaching in your, in your group, the importance of being disciplined in terms of freeze being against you. I think that's a massive learning curve for coaches here this evening. Definitely. Okay, we're moving on. I hope we're not going too fast. Please, in the chat function, guys, put in any questions if we, if we want anything clarified. Okay, Claire, let's move it on. So we've got rule number six here in front of us now. And a player goes to pick the ball up. Her hands are below her knees, but not on the ball. What should the referee do? Play on, throw in, or award a free? So the player's going to pick it up. Her hands are down below her knees, but they're not on the ball. What does the ref do? Play on, throw it in, or award a free? It's an interesting one. I suppose the hand below the knees. I suppose if there's coaches here tonight, what is that deemed? That could help you. That might be a bit of a hint if the hands are beyond the knees. What does that mean? So it's an interesting one, really. And I suppose it's another one that probably coaches aren't aware of, uh, Claire. Do you know um, this rule? Um, so let's see how people are getting on. So four people have come in so far. So keep coming, guys. The hands are below the knees. What should the referee do? Player goes to pick up the ball. The hands are below the knees, but they're not on the ball. What should the ref do? But they're not on the ball. Okay. So we've a split decision on this one, haven't we? Yeah, well, they're coming in. We've got all three answers of it have a bit of a ticking on it. Um <laughs> so it's it's really the majority are saying A, and then it's 50-50 after that, Claire. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah, you know, so that, that's um, what we have there. Well, sure, look, we we give the old answer. And C, so a player should not kick the ball as an opponent is about to pick it up or retake it into possession. So that's interesting. So with the hands below the knees means a player is in possession of the ball, Claire, really. That's what it's saying. 
Yeah, it, it, the, the big one is, I think, where people get caught there, Will, is to think because the hands aren't on the ball that it's fair game. But in ladies' football, as soon as the hands go below the knee, you know, and they're saying it becomes dangerous. If somebody's going to attempt to pick it up and somebody comes in with the foot, that's how we see a lot of broken fingers, etc. cetera. Um, but it doesn't have to be. And this is where people get caught. You'll hear people saying, but our hands weren't on the ball. It doesn't matter. As long as in ladies' football, as soon as they go below the knee, it's a free. So therefore, from a coaching perspective, the player going for the ball to have the confidence, get the hands below the knees, get the hands below the knees, because therefore you're deemed in possession of the ball by the referee. But also, I suppose, as, as players who are tackling, there's no point putting a boot in. Why do you put a boot in when now you know it's going to be a free against you? Okay, so therefore it's vitally important. Be patient as a player. Be patient till she brings the ball into possession and then tackle her appropriately whether when the ball is presented out of the body, whether it be hop or solo. So how many times do we give away a free by putting the boot in but you know what? Uh, it's actually free uh, if by doing that. So coaching players, maybe if the hands are below the knees of the opposition, don't tackle, don't put the boot in, wait till the player brings the ball in possession and presents it to a proper tackle. Or, and the player obviously going for the ball, don't be afraid to put the hands on the knees. Is there anything coming through the chat function that needs to be answered there? Uh, I think I saw something coming through there, Claire. It was just a clarification on the question. It didn't say that someone wanted to pick the ball. Oh, apologies. Yeah. understand. Excellent. Excellent. So I hope you're learning it, everybody, tonight. So I think it's, it's always, you always learn the rules. Um, and somebody so, so. has said there, well, I suppose it's probably worth answering as well. What is two opposing players both have hands below the knees, but either in possession? Okay. Um, that's fine as long as nobody comes in to kick it. So t- two people have the right to put their hands down to try and pick up the ball. Um, and that's no foul until whatever one, whoever wins it, wins it. It's, it's if somebody then puts a foot in. A foot in. Try and kick the ball, ball away. away. So obviously two players going down for the ball. It's fair game. It's, it's fair game. But it's, I suppose if someone comes in with a boot in, okay, that's a vitally important. Yeah. Good clarity. Good clarity. And thanks for the question. If you need, remember, go back to my original slide. If you need more clarity, ask the question. If you don't ask the question, you won't get the answer. If you don't get the answer, you're still going away on knowing the rule. Okay. A player tossed the ball with one hand and plays it with the other hand. What should the referee do? A water free or play on? So which is it, guys? This is tossing. So basically what I mean by this is that do I have the ball and I have it in my right hand and I toss it and I hit it with my right hand again. You know, so I throw it up in the air and I, t- and I, and I hit it again with my right hand to pass it to a player. Do you reward a free referee or do you play on? This is an interesting one, Claire. I think it's another one that I don't think people are aware of. That's why we sort of pick them, folks. So don't be going away thinking, God, I don't know the rules, you know. Uh, we sort of pick these ones to sort of delve into it all a bit different and, and a bit more, a little more than anything. Yeah, great stuff. So we're nearly 50% true, guys. We're going through them well, but we don't want to go too fast. We want to make sure. Okay, so it's um, 50-50 nearly. Yeah, so this is great. So I got you think, Claire, your prize is safe. Unless yeah. someone's getting them all right, but I'll ask everybody in a minute to let me know what they get out of it. At half time, I'll ask you. But um, I'd say no, Claire, you're okay. I'd say. Okay, the answer is it's actually B, play on. Wow. So it's not following the ball, Claire. No, it definitely isn't. Um, so what we're saying is a player may not throw the ball, so they didn't throw the ball. Didn't throw the ball. However, she can throw it up with one hand and strike it away with that same hand. And that could be one if you're a player can be caught out and they might only be able to get one hand free um, and, and they can play it on and they're not aware of it. I would say, from a coaching perspective, guys, how do you practice this in your sessions? I would say, do you know you're doing the ball familiarization at the start of your sessions? Do you know with every player is a ball or you might have one ball per two and you're practicing hand passing over and back? We well, practice that idea. Right, guys, on your right hand, tip the ball up and pass it with your right hand. Tip the ball up and pass it with your left hand. Tip the ball up and pass it with your right hand. So you're now practicing in action. Now they're getting aware in their minds. I actually can do this in a game. So if it's the case that my left hand is for balance and I'm, I'm trying to pass the ball with my right hand, tip it up and pass it with the same hand. So you're getting it into the mind. So in your ball familiarization drills at the start of your sessions, when you're passing the ball over and back and kick passing over and back, practice between two players passing the ball off a wall or even with a, with a partner, that idea of tipping the ball up and passing it with the same hand. It's an interesting skill that maybe we don't practice enough. So interesting one, Claire. Interesting one. And again, 50-50 in terms of who taught they knew the rule and didn't know the rule. So I think we leave the old referees alone for a while, I think, for a while. I think we will. I think we will. Okay. After this one, I'll ask you how you're getting on out of eight. So we're halfway there. Can a player, 
Uh, take a quick free kick and is she allowed up to four meters? So Claire, what's this one? So can a player take a quick free kick and is she allowed up to four meters? So this is a, this is another one. So, okay, is it? Yes or no. Or no. <laughs> is it yes or no? So can I take a quick free quick and can I take four meters while I'm doing it? So I get a free. Okay, I want to take a fast one. I'm covering four meters while I'm doing it. Can I do that? We're starting to come in again, well. Yeah, great engagement tonight from everybody. It's yeah. fantastic. Great, guys. It's great to see. Um, so please, if you want to clarify, just use the chat function. And Claire, you can let us know how are things going from the audience. Yeah, well, we, we nearly have them all in. We've, we're 21 out of the 24, so another five seconds and we'll, and we'll be letting it go. And and you'll love this because we'll probably <laughs> show you how even it is again. <laughs> I hope it's, uh, well, please, uh, geez, uh, 50 50 guys 50 50 i hope the two in Caragaline aren't fighting now jesus lads, i hope you're not i hope i hope you're still going to be friends after this guys um but it's 50 50 okay yeah. so let's see what the answer is lads um interesting one the answer is yes whoa interesting clear tell me yeah, What's so the, the rule is in this is in the interest of continuous of play, all free kicks except for penalty, so that's important. And free kicks on the 13 meter lane may be taken immediately at the spot indicated by the referee. A referee may allow advantage up to four meters for a quick free to be taken. So it's something that definitely is neutralized in the rule book. Um, you are allowed to take a quick free, and it's you're allowed them a couple of steps to, to clear off and and to get the game going again as fast as possible. You just can't have it for penalty kicks around the 13 meter line. So I'll throw it over to you from a coaching perspective. Yeah, geez, I would say they are clear. In a, if you're playing any kind of small sided games, condition games, I would promote that big time. I would probably have a, a condition in my small side game whereby if we get a free, you're taking it fast, you can take the four meters. Then I would again make it part of my condition in the small side game. So I would say, right, for the next five minutes, every free is a fast free. It's a fast free. Okay, you're allowed up to four meters. So every free is a fast free. So you're, you're applying a condition to a small side game to get players used to make taking advantage of this rule. So I, I just think, uh, I don't think a lot of as we know tonight, 50% of the coaches weren't aware of it. So again, though, if you're going to apply to coaching, then practice in your small side of games. Have a condition. Every free tonight in, in this game is fast. Okay? You're allowed four meters. So therefore, getting, getting used to it. Before we move on, I sorry, Claire. It, well, like that's what I'm just thinking here as a coach as well. The advantage you could have of your players know that. You know, they know, right, when I get a free, my corner forward's darting out to the left. Yeah. And we kicking the quick free into there, and then my midfielder drops through the middle. You could have a set play around this if you get a quick free around the half back mid midfield line, and the other team wouldn't even be awake to it possibly if you're doing it right. Very good. So there's a pattern. You could have a pattern of play or a set play or a set piece. Jeez, like you know, you could catch a team in the hop, and it only takes half a second, and you're on, you're on, you're on the uh, the the advantage all straight away. So yeah, even practicing those little patterns or those set plays, clear. Excellent, great idea. Okay, before we move on for the last eight questions of the night, how are you getting on? Be very honest in the chat function. How are you getting on out of eight? Just, just put in your number. Look, uh, we won't be publishing these anywhere else. Just be very honest on how are you getting on, um, and we'll take from there. So, Frank, how are you, Frank in Monaghan? Hope you're well. Cheese, Frank. Jeez, you, you must have nothing else to be doing. You're on every webinar. Fair play, it's great to have you, my friend. Uh, five, Patricia, six. Uh, so how's everybody getting on? So five or six, not bad. Okay, not bad. Adam, keep it going. <laughs> Stay positive. Um, Colette, seven. Too slow. C Colette, what did I say? Don't blame the uncontrollable now. Did you hear me now? Uh, it's vitally important uh, that we stay on top of it. Uh, Aiden Robinson. Jeez, I don't know, Claire. You have to send something out to Aiden. Yeah. Fair play, Joe. You just want to catch uh, me, right? <laughs> just to, Jesus, Aiden, I don't know about that. We'd have to have a little bit of an inquiry into that one. But great. Well done, Aiden. Fair play, guys. Well done. Well done. Okay, let's move it on. Let's move it on. Is there more coming in, Claire? There is. There's four out of eight and four. So every, everybody's working away. Well, everybody's working away. Now, four, 50%. Not bad, now. If we look at the positive side of it, do you know? Or, you know, let's use the coaching terminology. We have a bit to improve on. A small bit to improve on, but we'll get there. Okay, how long can a referee play advantage? As long as they like, which could happen in a lot of games, maybe. Um, three seconds, 10 seconds, or five seconds. So how long can a play, referee play advantage? So is it as long as they think? Well, three seconds, 10, or five we're having a bit of a mix in here. I think someone's having a laugh at me as well. Well, 
So how long can a referee play the advantage? They're all starting to come in right, Lena. Good stuff. You can let me know how things going. Yeah, we're, we're starting to get one of them starting to turn away as a front runner, but the rest of them are catching up again. Well, so it um, definitely opens your eyes. I'm going to end it here and I'll share the results with you. Okay, so, so, so one says as long as they like it. I do, <laughs> is that just being kind of sarcastic? Maybe. I hope, I hope it is. I hope it is. <laughs> so we have one says three, uh, 40% said 10, and the majority, 50%, say five seconds. And the answer is, guys, I should get an old drum or something. Okay, the answer is five seconds. So what's the pertinent point here for coaches and referees to know, I suppose, Claire? Or yeah, the advantage one's a really important one. Well, I think um, people really need to understand it. Um, you, ref only can play it for up to five seconds. Their hand must be in the air and stay in the air to indicate, indicate that the advantage is being played. Um, I'm encouraging all referees now to try and say advantage on, advantage off, or just to allow if a player to went past them to know that they're actually gaining the advantage. Um, we're, just say a referee has playing advantage will and two seconds into it to realise that that player's been bottled up and there's no advantage. The referee can stop the play any time within the five seconds and bring it back to the original free. And I think that's really important. Like they can stop any time within the five seconds if there's been no advantage. Just say the, the, the player's been pushed right into the corner. That's of no advantage. So they can bring it back to that original free. Um, there still is disciplinary action so just because a referee is playing an advantage it doesn't mean that they shouldn't tick or yellow or red card somebody that has fouled i so. suppose classic from a coaching perspective so if a player uh, was fouled and the referee put up the hand and give the fight and the player wanted to stop and take the free that is well within the right to stop the game and say i'm taking the free yeah but they need to stop up yeah well we would say the referee's trying to play an advantage for a reason um okay. Okay. and we would indicate well that they, they, they go with that because it's usually because the, there's an open in there but if a player feels like there's definitely no advantage in front of them you know and they've heard the whistle go i think that's important but make sure that the referee is giving you an advantage you know you don't okay. want to just stop and, and they haven't been giving you an so advantage. it's very important the action of the referee to highlight his advantage yeah and obviously the player being aware of that and then obviously can see what's in front of them and make the call themselves okay today obviously and nine up, nine up. times out of ten they're low advantage for for an advantage if that makes sense uh do you mm -hmm. know what i mean like Claire? especially up front well like if you're a forward and you're getting an advantage shoot the ball because if it goes exactly. wide, the referee has every right to pull it back and give you that shot, that free from where it was, as long as long, and this is key, as long as it's within the five seconds. And um, the other thing is the advantage is only five seconds. If you're fouled again within that, the referee can't give another five seconds to make a ten. They have to give the free from the second place you were fouled. Yeah, I think that's good from a player's perspective. So if, if I know there's an advantage rule and I was going to give the ball to the corner forward, give the ball. Because if she doesn't win it, the referee will call it back. If you're in front of the goal or a point and you know what, you're kind of being dragged and pulled you know, and you, you shoot and it goes wide, it's going to be called back. So therefore, the players seeing out the action, okay, see what the result is. The res if the result is good, they'll allow it. If not, they'll bring it back. Do you know what I mean? So it's vitally important that players are aware of that. Very much aware of that. Okay. So play it to the, I suppose, play the advantage, in other words, really, do you know? Okay. Um, the advantage rule on this one, we'll just show it here, Claire. Yeah, I'm just going to talk through it here. You can see the Donegal player has been fouled. Uh, the referee comes into play, his hands up. He said, Fancy John. The Donegal player shoots the ball. Look, you can quite clearly see it's went wide. It's within the five seconds. Can you see the referee appear back onto the screen? He is circulated back there and he's pulled it back out to allow the free to take place. So yes. he's let the advantage go and see if Donegal can work something from it. It doesn't happen and he blows the whistle and indicates and he pulls it right back out to where he is and allows the free kick to be taken from there. And, and I suppose that's really important and completely allowed within the rule. And often you hear people shouting at rest for doing that because there's, there's a misunderstanding of the advantage. Yeah, that's excellent. That's very good. So go for score. Go for shot. If it doesn't happen, it'll be come back it's for the for the free. Okay, rule ten. We're 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 near the the last. Uh, shall I say? Oh, geez, this is uh, our old um, our old uh, 
Slides right, coming backwards here. But anyway, <laughs> what a fence is a high tattle. Um, is a non tactical tactical red card or yellow card. So if you looked at our on our LJFA YouTube channel, guys, we actually have a specific webinar looking at the tattle and the high tattle is part of that. So please, guys, if you've looked at that, you should be able to answer this. So what a fence is a high tattle. Now look at the question. That the, the, the clue is in the question. What if fence is a high tattle? If you know the other rules around high tattle, you should be able to get the answer. So, Claire, it's an interesting one again. Yeah, it's a hard one, Will. Um, there, there can be some confusion over it just because it's a lack of understanding around the wording, around the room more than anything. But we're all turning away here with uh, half, half of our respondents in. With a bit of a mixed bag. Good stuff, guys. Keep it going. Keep it going. We'll give it another 10 seconds and we'll give you the answer and we'll move it on from there. Uh, it seems to be, again, another mixed bag. Yeah. Gonna show you so it just shows you here tonight before we give the answer it just shows you guys if we don't get consistency so if everybody don't take an ownership of getting to know the detail and the clarity around the rules then how do we get the consistency so everybody plays a role don't they Claire? everyone plays a role in this Definitely. okay yeah. so we give the answer and the answer is d Claire. so the answer is it's a yellow card offense so interesting uh, what's your thoughts from a, what's important points from, from coaches know from a rule perspective, uh, Claire? Uh, the, the high tackle there only is two offences, well, and people really don't seem to deem this. If you commit a high tackle in ladies football, it's either a yellow card or a red card. If it's deemed a high tackle, it just it's a yellow. If it's deliberate, and the word deliberate coming in there and underlined makes it a red card. So a high tackle, and this is big, big, big one. Anything from here. From above the chest up in ladies football is a high tackle and it can be from the back or from the side um it doesn't have to just be a frontal one so that's really probably important to highlight in terms of rules and i would say from a coach's perspective as well in that one what i coach my players is that there's three things referees look for the force the movement and the intent so for example if a player's coming at you, and you stay, say a player stands her ground and she puts her hand out and she catches the player high tackle it's a yellow card offense because the force wasn't there the intent wasn't there or the movement was there the hand came out and the player obviously got caught in the high tackle so it's a, a yellow card offense he was deemed dangerous so there for 10 minutes think about playing time but the force the intent of the movement now if a player's coming at me and i my hand came from behind. The force was obvious. The intent was obvious because the movement of the hand and connect with the player above the chest. Then obviously that's a deliberate and therefore it's a red card offence. And I think it's just important to know those three things when classifying whether it be yellow or red is the force, the movement and the intent of the player clear. Would I be right in saying that? Yeah, well, and they would be the same people's words around the charge as well. Um, and the high tackle, the, to be honest, the yellow card's usually more of a clumsy tackle where the player's hand's been hanging and just hasn't got down quick enough and, and catches them high. There's no real deliberate or nastiness in it. And the high tackle tends to be where they've kept it up on purpose. They had lots of opportunity to get that hand down and they haven't. They've actually brought it up an inch towards a player and that's where word comes into to its own between the yellow and the red and the referees are usually pretty good at knowing the difference regarding these and like with our rule guys non-deliberate contact so ladies football obviously there's going to be some sort of uh contact but once it's not deliberate so therefore a shoulder to shoulder so if two players looked at each other and they actually went to shoulder each other that's that's not allowed in ladies football so non-deliberate contact but again guys we have a web uh, a webinar specific on this area on our lgfa youtube channel please give a look at it it's well worth the view so just another one there on the title that said, I'm not going to go into this in too much detail because it's all on the webinar. But all you need to be aware of is when the ball is in the body, when a player is a ball in the body, she cannot be dispossessed, legally dispossessed. You have to wait till she presents the ball, whether it be out of the body or it be a solo or a hop. So we always say, coach your players to be patient tattlers. And coach the near hand tattle is probably the best tattle we would advocate. Obviously, there's a frontal tattle as well. So... Don't tackle until the ball is presented. We have players always grappling and they're fouling, but obviously if they're aware that when the ball is in the body, we can't tackle them, but they have to do something every four steps. So therefore, a patient tattler is the best tattler. So I would say, guys, is on the LJFA YouTube channel, if you want to know more about this topic, it has clips and it has more detail, go on to our LJFA YouTube channel and learn more around that area of deliberate contact and the tattle uh, in ladies football. Very worthwhile. But if you're using the fist, in tattling, 
Again, it's a red card offence, especially with the forced intent. Okay, so it's vitally important that we're aware of all that. Sorry, yeah, am I right in saying that? But I must check yeah, out. The, f- the first is, it, uh, if you bring the first into contact, it's a yellow will. A yellow, sorry, um, I knew that. But if it's a stripe, it's a red. It's a red card, apologies. If, yeah. if, 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 it's, if the fist hits the ball, it's a yellow. As soon as the clue is the fist, if it comes in and hits the ball, it's a yellow. If it hits the player, it becomes a strike, and it's a red. So it's Excellent, thanks, because I had this one at the, the coach education course the weekend, so I, I knew I, I had to double check that one. So thanks, Claire, fair play. So just interesting from coaches good point of view to be aware of these scenarios and these things because therefore it'll keep your mind active on the sideline and you can focus on what you need to be focusing on okay here we are this fool who's fooling who again it's something that's in that youtube channel i'm not going to go into too much detail here okay so who's fooling who so we know that you can't touch the player with the ball in the body the girl in the white has the ball in the body okay the girl in the blue is tackling her but she's putting her hand on the body so therefore it's a free but the girl in the white is handing off, is pushing off with the with the elbow. Okay, the force, the movement. So therefore, if she has movement of the elbow towards the player's chest, then obviously she's fouling. So in that instance, what happens there, Claire, really, is the, the, the referee deems of who's fouling first or who made the initial foul that will be deemed the, the actual tackle. Am I right in saying that, Claire? Yeah, definitely. And it's, um, and it's something to be aware of, though, isn't it? Do you know, it's something to be aware of, the push off with the elbow. It's one that people don't realise, well, but, you know, it can, it can be a very dangerous one, and it is, it is one that is called more and more. Yeah, excellent. Good stuff. I um, just wanted to chat okay there, Claire. I think there was a few coming in the chat, so we'll just check it out to make sure everything's okay. So as I said here, guys, when the ball's about, you can't be dis- uh, dispossessed. Coach your players to be good tattlers. Wait till the ball is presented out of the body, then make your move. When you make your move, you won't follow the player. You'll get the ball back, and off you go. Okay. And this one's same thing again, guys. Okay, so positioning of the feet, uh, patience in terms of the defender, in terms of the player is going to run past the player one on one. Again, the hand is on the body, the ball is in the body, so therefore it's a foul. So again, guys, on our LJFA YouTube channel, I'm not going to go into detail here tonight because it's on our LJFA YouTube channel, how to coach the tattle. But just for yourself as coaches to be aware of, once the ball is in the body, you cannot tattle the player or put your hand on the body. It's a free. So it's just vitally important we, we coach our players to be good tattlers. Wait till the ball is presented, hopped or soloed. Well, I okay. think the big thing is, is the hands on the body. And yeah. that's for, from a rule perspective, from my element. As soon as they put the hands on the player, it's a free. So people are telling them to push off like that. Yeah. It's free. As, soon, as soon as the hands go into the body in ladies' football, it's a free. The tackle is on the ball only. So and also, we see in coaching where players are you know, pushing the player back and stuff. You're actually coaching your players to foul. Okay, so it's just something to be very much aware of. Okay, next one, rule 11. We have five rules left. What offense is hand passing the ball without a visible striking action? Is it a non technical foul, a yellow card, a red card, or a technical foul? And I suppose we'll answer this afterwards, but if you know what a technical foul is and a non technical foul is, you'll be able to answer these questions. So, Without visible striking action, and it's something very interesting in terms of a coaching perspective, in particular with younger age, and get a good habit from the very start. So, Claire, how are things working there? Yeah, they're all flying in now. We're, we're nine or ten in, um, and the rest are on their way. Keep it going, guys. Keep it going. So, what a fence. It's hand passing the ball without a visible striking action. It looks like a throwing action. Okay, guys. We'll give We're it another 10 seconds. A few more. Just click away there, folks. So don't, don't, be wor- don't be worried, guys. Yep. Okay, Claire, you can launch it. Okay, so interesting. Sorry. The majority say it's a technical foul. Okay. We'll answer that in a minute. So, yes, it's D, a technical foul. So, hand passing the ball without a visible striking action. And, Claire, from a rules perspective, is there anything you'd like to highlight? Yeah, I suppose the technical foul, mostly, majority of the time, we would say technical fouls are fouls on the ball. Well, Yes. And on, our non-technical fouls are what we would say sort of fouls on the player. On the player. Um, and th- they're all tickable offences. So all any non-technical foul is a tick where our technicals aren't. Um, so I think it's important, and especially in ladies football as well, that the hand pass is a visible striking action. So yes. we have a slightly different in the men's in our rule that as long as it's a visible striking action, so we can strike sideways, we can strike behind our back, but as long as yeah. it's a striking action, um, where I know the men's game can't. So that's interesting from a coaching perspective. The so girls can use any way of a hand pass, any form, right? But once there's visible striking action of the hand to the ball. And I think it's very important. On the non-technical fouls, Claire, I'm right in saying it's the third. So the first one you're kind of, you know, you're kind of, you know, just observed. Second one, you're you're ticked. And the third one, 
you're, you're gone from an, uh, a yellow card offence. So three non three actions of a non-technical foul is a sim binning. Am I right in saying that? Ten minutes playing yeah. time in the sim bin. It's a persistent foul. And well, it's a rule that we have in a good while now. And if you have three non-technicals, any non-technicals, a combination of three of them, um, and it's a yellow card and you're off the pitch for 10 minutes. So it's really important that you're communicating with your coach if you, if you get two ticks. You know, because they might want to take you off instead of losing you. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, and from a coaching perspective, when you're coaching the hand pass, guys, vitally important that we coach the hand pass. How many times do we see players having both movement of hand when they pass the ball, both movements of the hand? That looks like a throwing action. Even though she may have connected with it, it looks like a throwing, throwing action. So from a coaching perspective, I would always coach the players that with the ball on the hand, so the hand with the ball on it, that stays static. And there's vis- visible striking action with the hand or fist on the other hand. So the, the, the real kind of exaggerated movement from the hand that's striking. Again, if it's overhead, there's visible striking action from the hand. But if you have the other hand moving as well, that's where referees could team that it's a throw in action. Because if I do that, or if I do this, that looks like a throwing action. But if one hand stays static, the hand with the ball, and the other hand is moving, then obviously then the referee deems that's clear, visible striking action. So, so just something to be aware of, because a lot of people, a lot of players use both hands. They, they probably move both hands when they're visibly, when they're passing the ball. And sometimes it could be deemed as a troll. So very important that we want the ball, the hand with the ball doesn't move, and the, ball, the hand that's striking has a good swindle, uh, pendulum action. Okay. I hope that helps. Okay. Use of foul... Yeah, foul or improper language. This is now clear um, that it's kind of, I suppose, to no one. It's just like, in general, where a player just use foul and improper language in general. So they might have missed the free or they might have missed the ball and they just say an imp- uh, 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 foul and improper language to themselves. What is it? Yeah, what is it? Jumping between two here, flat out. Well, yeah, and I think this is one that even in our in our games is not pulled up enough of uh, Claire. Uh, do you know? I think it's something that we need to get more consistency in this one, definitely. Yeah, it, and it's one that isn't penalised, William. It isn't, and people no. say, "Oh, sure, look, you know why?" But <laughs> it, it, it isn't. Yeah, so it's interesting. Fifty percent then, then say non technical. Forty percent say yellow, which is uh, interesting. Let's see what the answer is. The very best look. Here we go. The answer is a non-technical foul. So if I kick the ball over the sideline, Claire, and I goes off or whatever, is that a free against me? Free against you and a tick. So that's important to remember. It's also a non-technical, which means you can be kicked for that one. And that can be one of your strikes basically gone. So if I say something out of frustration, it's a, it could be, the referee has within the rights to give me a free against me. Yeah. So if you're a forward, and this is the example I always use, because I've done it myself and you're going one-on-one with a keeper and you blast it and it goes wide and the only person you're annoyed at is yourself and you say for sake and um, the referee is in every right because it's inappropriate language foul language to give you a tick and to give a free against you wow. and, and the reason for it well is people might say oh that's a bit extreme they're only talking about themselves but the amount of young girls we have watching our games and role models, and, and we just don't feel that the foul, foul language is a place in our game, so it okay. is punishable. So by, if, um, but if I, if I use foul language to an opposition or my teammate, what's that clear? Is that a yellow card? Yeah. So if I use it to my teammate or my... Okay, and if I use it to the referee, what happens? That's a red. Any red match card. official. So if I so. use it to my... Even somebody in my own team, if she just say, she's pissed me off and I give out to her and give 90, the referee should be giving both cheek curses back to me. That would be a yellow card to both. So go off for 10 minutes and think about it for playing time. 10 minutes playing time. Think about it. Okay. Teammate or colleague and anyone involved in a match official. So even if it's an umpire, you know, if you think an umpire made a wrong call and you turn around and you say, F off, you're blind or whatever. um, That's a red card to you and off you go. So that's our sort of three levels regarding language. Well, therefore, so guys, coaching in games, coaching when you're playing your small side games and players start using language, like, again, they might mean it, but they did it. Give it free against them. They need to be made aware that this is not acceptable. It's, it's deemed improper language. It's a fraud against you. So therefore, as coaches, we need to apply the rules in our, in our training sessions so that they're very much aware of the rule because it could cost us in a game. So I, I think that's a massive learning, massive learning. And the different levels to, to your opposition and your teammate and into the referee. So there's different levels there. Okay, what if it's the player uh, in possession of the ball leading with her elbow? So we kind of saw that in a previous clip or in a, in a video or a, 
uh, a picture, is it a red card, yellow card, non-technical or technical? Now, I suppose it comes into intent and force and movement, but she's leading with her elbow. So can you explain what leading with the elbow means, um, uh, Claire? Yeah, what you're really talking about here is that when somebody has gained possession, William, and they've bust out and they've lifted that elbow. So they're really coming out, they've got their possession and they're, they're, they're coming out like this, using their elbow to come forward. To, to gain so, a bit of move or a bit of space or to yeah. get that, yeah, okay, okay, right. Like a push off nearly, you know? I get you. But they're, they're, the elbow's coming out first, the ball's in and they're coming out like that. Okay, interesting. So is it a red card, a yellow card, a non-technical foul or a technical foul? What is it? So the last few just want to click in there. Interesting. Uh, again, it's, 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 it's a mix across the board. Something yellow, something red, something non-technical, others think technical. So look at the, the inconsistency in the... In, you know, it's, it's great to see this, guys. That's a massive learning club for tonight that we all have a role to play in learning the rules of the game. And the answer is clear. It, it's a non-technical, non well, and phone. it is actually one of the most debated ones. You know, when I'm given, doing out referee courses all over Ireland, it's people can never decide whether it's a non-technical or a yellow um, because maybe they're getting confused within the charging rule. But, you know, what we're talking about here is the actual, they've, they've led with the elbow, they gain a bit of an advantage coming out, and it's a non-technical and a tick in that instance again. And it looks going back to that picture earlier on, the girl who was remembered with the elbow up. But that was actually a perfect picture. To, sh yeah. to sh highlight, she was leading the elbow, so the referee, the referee deems of who was fouling first. So it's actually, and even a push-off clear. I'm right saying a push-off is a foul. Yeah. So if I, if I got the ball and I pushed off a player to get a bit of space, that's a foul, clear. Yeah, you aren't allowed to push, so that's a foul so too. Again, the intent and the movement of the hand is key in that one, and the, and the force. Okay, so the force, the movement of the hand, and the intent says a lot for the for, for the decision making of the referee. Okay, two questions left. What offence the player in possession of the ball takes more than four steps without playing the ball? So what happens here? Think about what is a technical foul, or what's a non-technical foul, a yellow card, red card, and I think we'll be able to answer this one. And I think we kind of answered it earlier on. So what offence is a player uh, in possession of the ball taking more than four steps? So she takes more than four steps without playing the ball. Okay, so at least, anyway, everybody's saying it's either technical or non-technical. So this is interesting. So a technical is on the ball, non-technical is off the ball or, or on the person, nine times out of ten. So maybe that might help people. But I think everybody's nearly in there, Claire. Nearly everybody's in there, Will, so we'll, we'll show them up. Good stuff. So the majority say it's a technical foul. Is it? I wonder. It's a technical foul. Well done. So overcarrying the ball. Anything here you want to highlight there, Claire? No, I think the biggest thing is that you do have four steps um, and you might talk about that more in a coaching, but that's all they have, four steps and it has to be a bounce or a solo or the referee is entitled to call you up. Yeah, I would say from a coaching perspective, Claire, I would always coach players to head the head up. So sometimes so when they win the ball, head up, take your four steps, bounce, four steps, and then do what you need to do. Now you've gained massive ground by, by doing that. So play at the head up. I would always encourage players, take your four steps, bounce, take your next four steps. Now you've gathered ground. Because if you sold the ball straight away, then the head is down. Obviously, scenarios may, may lead to you having to sold the ball with the head down, but therefore straight your head's down. So try and get their players to play with the head up. By playing with the head up, take advantage of their four-step rule, bounce the ball four steps. Can you imagine the distance you've covered? It's just a short place of time. Okay. Um, okay, well, second. I'm gonna, well, I'm going to jump back here. We just had a question from Adam, and I don't want to yeah. skip on before it gets too far. No bar. It's leading with the elbow, which is obviously one that's always that bit tricky. So he's asking, what's the difference between leading with the elbow and making a striking action towards a player with the elbow? Um, and, and Adam, you know, for me, it's quite clear. When they're leading with the elbow, all they're doing is they're moving to try and gain a bit of an advantage. Yeah. Um, yeah. But when they're actually striking, it's actually coming out and there's a movement towards them, you know? Yeah, it goes uh, back to the point again, doesn't it clear? Adam, the force the intent and the movement will determine that, if that makes sense, Adam. So if I put my hand up like that, just like that, to gain a bit of ground, then Joe, yeah. you're just trying his face. But now, if I went up like this, Adam, force, intent, and movement, that's a different animal. So it, the force, intent, and movement really determines whether that's, okay, just trying to gain a bit of, uh, bit of space, right. or you know what, you're intendingly there to hurt the opposition. I hope, Adam, that answers your question. Yeah, especially if there's people around you. Well, you might be trying to just 
So yeah, just try and get a bit of space. You get a bit of hordes. But yeah. if there's force and intent but and if movement, you're coming that's different. Like that and you're yeah. catching someone, it's a strike. It's a strike. The force, the movement, and the uh, intent. What offense is interfering with a free taker by jumping up and down, waving the hands, or any physical or verbal um, intimidation aimed at distracting the free taker? So, guys, we always be waving the hands and clapping the hands and say, yeah, 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 it's going wide, it's going wide, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, actually, what's the rule on this? What can the referee do? Is it a yellow card offense, a red card offense, a non-tactical, or a tactical foul? And actually, clear. I think this goes, this goes on an awful lot in games yeah. where more and you know, more recently, and a lot of teams are using this tactic of Murray I using verbals to put players off. You know, so actually they could actually get penalised from doing that sort of stuff. Yeah, there's a lot of that ball and wide. It's going wide. It's going wide, and she hasn't even stepped up to the plate. Yeah. So this is interesting to know because if coaches are advocating that sort of behaviour, then obviously there's going, there's going to be a consequence. So, you know, so let's see. What, what, what are people saying, Claire? Interesting, again, guys, the majority are saying non-tactical, but a few have said yellow or tactical. So let's see what the answer says. It's a non-tactical foul. So, Claire, tell me. So if I start doing this, is this um, what happens yeah, to me? It's a non-tactical foul. So, again, it's a tech. So it's really clear for me, folks. That's another tech. So if you've done that and pushed somebody and then pushed them or held their jersey the third time, you're, on, you're in the sin bin. I think the important thing is, well, you're completely entitled to come back and hold your hands up straight. But once this nonsense and the whistling starts, the referee is going to come down and take you and, you know, can bring the ball forward as well. So, so therefore, they lose it, do, do, they lose, do they lose the free? So, um, or they lose it, um, Claire? Well, they'll have had the free. So if oh, you sorry. have the free, it's the other team doing it. Okay. And so you can put the hands up, no bother, hands up, yep. once there's no movement of the hands and stuff like that. I think that's very important just from a coaching perspective that that, that, that behaviour is not tolerated in sessions. And also from coaches, as I say, guys, it's coming in a lot to the game where coaches are getting players to use verbals to try and put players off. I just don't like it. I just don't like it as a coach myself. Um, you know, if we can't dispossess a player properly, then using verbals, you know, could lead to actually a consequence now. So I just think that's important for coaches to be aware. Well, it could actually end up being a penalty. Like if somebody's standing on the 13 metre line and you're acting like that, the referee blew the whistle and gives that a penalty. Like for, for clapping your hands or striking or whistling, you know, it's very bad one to give away and a bad mistake. Yeah, I just, just, I suppose every has different ethos and philosophies, but it's just something I wouldn't advocate for my own players, you know, that sort of behaviour. Okay. How long has Sim been in 30 minute games, guys? Last one tonight. How long has Sim been in 30 minute games? Is it 10 minutes? Five minutes? 10 minutes playing time? I think I've answered this about 100 times. And uh, five minutes playing time. So, which is it, guys? Is it 10 minutes, five minutes, or 10 minutes playing time? I think I've answered this a few times. So, there's two people out there, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe, guys, hopefully, uh, just probably slipped the finger over there by accident on the, on the, on the button. So, um, you're possibly just hard to listen to, Will. <laughs> I listen, that could be a possibility too. I, I won't rule that one out. Well, okay. most, most of them are in there, Will, so we'll share it. And the answer is, it is actually 10 minutes playing time. And that's important to know, and even in games less than, than 30 minutes, it's important to know that as well, Claire. Yeah, well, the, my big emphasis in this one is playing time. The GAA in their sin bin rule, it's 10 minutes just from the minute you leave from the minute you go on. And some people are very confused by that. You'll, they'll say, I hear it all the time, saying, oh, she was sent off uh, at 22 minutes past. She's back at 32 minutes past. No, she's not. It's playing time. So I if there's any it. stoppage in play, yeah. the referee stops their watch. So it's really important to know that A, that's playing time. And B, we actually have three different sin bin times and they're all playing time. We have 10 minutes, five minutes, and three minutes. Okay. So the three minute playing time would be 15 minutes or less per half. So okay. mostly for like seven aside, nine aside competitions, that one would come into play where it's only three minutes. If it's anything above 15 minutes and below 30. So if it's 20 minute a half, like Fela or 20, some people are playing 25 minutes, you know, in the dark evenings a half, the sin bin then is only five minutes five playing minutes. time. So it's really important that, that you know, actually there's three different times as well. It's important to know that. But I suppose from a coaching perspective, how many times has these coaches practiced being up a player, being down a player? How many times do you practice? Okay, guys, player got sin bent. What do we do now? Okay, we work on those scenarios. 
And I think from a coaching perspective, we need to work on being up a player. What do we do when we have a player? And then when we're down a player, what do we do? And I would always advocate the coaches, guys. If a player is sin bins, nine times out of 10, we all get excited. Jesus, what are we going to do now? What are we doing? Jesus. I would say, relax. Let the game settle for a minute. See what happens. And then make your move. Because in your games, in coaching games, guys, okay, Claire Dowdle could be the best player who, when she's free, she's very good at running to space. She can understand the game. She's very good positioning, right? So let the game settle. See where Claire Dowdle is now on the field. Now, how do we make Claire Dowdle the free player if we're up a player? Does that make sense? So I would say as a coach, you have to practice that in your coaching sessions, but also on the side and on match day, let things settle. Don't get excited. Let the game settle. See what's happening and then apply your strategy as a result of what you see and get the right person on the ball or free, whatever it may be, okay? Just a few small things from a coaching perspective. Okay, Claire, just to, I suppose, you know, we're not going to go through all these, Claire, but there is a lot of rules there. We went through 16 rules tonight. There's a lot, a lot of rules there, Claire, isn't there? And I suppose it's important that coaches after tonight, guys, on the website, you can download the rules of our game. Loads of rules there. We're not going to go through them all. As you see there, guys, a lot of rules. They're all our red card offences. You need to be aware of what those red cards offences are. Um, and it's vitally important that you're clear on those um, on those rules. Is there anything you want to say in that before I move on to the other ones? Uh, yeah, there's just 12 in the red, and they're usually the easiest ones, Will. And the one that probably highlights to me is we actually have object in the striking one now. So striking or making a striking action towards an opponent or colleague with a hand, arm, fist, elbow, head, near object. So that's if somebody throws a water bottle, a gum shield, you know, they're all sending off. And just really, you can download it as an app on your homepage, the official yeah. guide or the playing rules. I have it on my phone. And it means you can check things at the side of the pitch or during your coaching sessions. It's really handy to do. That's brilliant. Download it, guys. Download it tonight. But I always think with the red card offences, anything that is forceful with intent or is deliberate is nine times out of ten a red card offence, Claire. Look at all the yellow ones. How many yellow ones are there, Claire? We have not as many yellows. Um, I think we have 11. We have 11. Yeah, so again, it's just being aware of what those, like, you know, kicking the ball with intent as an opposing player is about to pick it up. That's a yellow card offence. So when a player comes in with it, again, it goes back to those three words. If there's force, movement, and intent, it, it really distinguishes whether it's a foul, a yellow card, or a red card. Doesn't it really clear? I, I just yeah. think those three words even would help an awful lot with people. You know? The big one as well is the persistent fouling, which we covered on the non-technical. Yeah. People don't realise that, and we'll show you the non-technicals, but it's really important to know that we do have persistent fouling. And the other one I would say is, and I would really advocate this, we have a great video that's about max five minutes long on charging yes and it explains the different levels of the chargeable and it's on our youtube channel again if you just type in ljfa youtube channel the charge and it's worth any coach watching yeah and it's also on the on the coach the tattle one as well claire but i know there's one there on its own so guys on our ljfa youtube channel give a look at it i think it's a great video great video so here are all the non-technical fouls we're not going to go through them just low there again nine times out of ten it's more likely a foul on the person isn't it really clear that's the key for just coach just be aware of for now is that nine times out of ten it's it's, it's a foul on the on, on a player really isn't it clear do you know that's um, well, there's 18 of them so that means there's 18 chances of you getting a tick through a game um, and people don't realize pushing or holding the tick you know impeding that player or a third player tackle, the pulling, a pulling an opponent's jersey is a tick. So how many times do you see that? So yeah. I really think if you're going to sit down and take anything away from tonight, learn what the M18 non-technicals are and work on them from a coaching perspective. Exactly. Exactly. So like instead of pulling the jersey, why don't you get your defenders to push the player down to the side she doesn't want to go? And didn't wait for help defenders and, and defend that way rather than pulling the jersey and giving a free way. Again, it goes back to go back to that coach the tattle webinar. A lot of good stuff in it. So you do that three times, you'll get a yellow card, 10 minutes playing time in the simp. And look at the um, I suppose the 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 technical fouls. Again, the majority of times they're on on the ball, really, aren't they? Those simplistic yeah. ones on the ball. But uh, they're, they're just things that we need to be very much aware of. Yeah, we've we've nine of them, and they're just ones to look at. So descent, one of the last slides, is there, what do you want to say to coaches on the descent one, um, Claire? 
it's a discipline again, folks. Yeah. So uh, any type of descent to the referee, um, you know, can bring the at forward thirteen meters, and thirteen meters can be a big difference. Yeah. And um, so let's make sure that they realise that 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 if the referee is given a free, what's the point in shouting? Ah, ref, that you're just putting it forward thirteen meters. Yeah. You've got a coach to encourage them to keep their mouths. And you won't change the decision. So therefore, put the ball down, get set, and move, and go again, and let's try and win the ball back rather than. I suppose, you know, knock at the referee and, and you know, maybe they, they got the rule right. Maybe you need to know the rules, you know, so that's the, that's the idea around it. Okay, guys, to finish off, thank you very much, Claire. I really enjoyed tonight. Guys, in the chat function, before we finish off, let us know how many you got out of 16. Let us know and be very honest now. Be very honest how many you got out of 16. But as Claire outlined on our LGFA website, there's the Play Rules, there's the app, that app, guys. Download it onto your phone and have that available to you. It's the Play Rules. It's a small pocket size. And then obviously then we have the official guide, which is a wider booklet that has the, the rules of the whole association involved in as well. So guys, we would advocate strongly if you need to know the rules of the game, go. And also in the chat function, let us know what's the one thing you're taking from tonight. Tell us what, what did you take from tonight and what do you learn from tonight. And as I said, guys, on the LJFA YouTube channel, uh, there's a, a specific webinar on the tattle. There's a, there's a good video on the charging. Please, guys, go and give a look at them. You know, when you get time over the coming, over the coming days and weeks, we'd appreciate it. Because the more consistency and understanding clarity of the rules, the better consistency we'll get. So understanding the detail, more clarity around the rules, leads to more consistency if we all play a role in that. So key messages tonight, Claire, are? Yeah, I think it's linking the rules to your session. And yeah. well, people don't do that enough. And the advantage that gives the coaches, I, I say all the time and people be laughing at me, you know, Better coaches are those that play by the rules because when you bring it into the games, if you know the rules, you know, you actually get better players from it and a better game plan and make life actually easier for yourself. Um, so it's important. And I would really emphasize, see that we play in rules one. It's tiny and that's everything a coach needs a note pocket yeah. place. Yeah, I think just coach, you know, give your players the best chance by coaching them within the rules. Again, you can't control the uncontrollable, what the referee does, what the opposition does, what the opposition manager does, the opposition players does. You can't control that. All you can control in your role as a coach is coach the players within the rules of the game. That's all you can do. You do that, you do a great job. So, um, so, and it's very important, as you say, look, hopefully this helped everyone tonight and it keeps you up to date the rules. As you never know all the rules. Always refer back. Like myself there, even though I did this on Saturday, I still had to refer about the, the, the yellow and the red card rule. So it's very important you keep updated and refreshing your mind on the rules of the game so basically uh claire i just want to say i really enjoyed tonight i hope you enjoyed tonight i hope everybody tonight on the on the call enjoyed it um so it's great to see that coach has got a lot out of it so claire any final note from yourself no that's it just well it's i i love these coming on and the coaches learning and if anyone has any queries ever over a rule you know, give me a shout. My email address is always on the website and you can just give me a shout and get anything clarified. And um, it's always better to coach with clarification than, than without it. So really, thanks for enjoying us. You were really interactive all night and, and I was delighted and it always opens my eyes up as well. So thank you. Excellent. Listen, Claire, I enjoyed tonight and I, I learned so much from yourself in terms of the rules and specifics about the rules. As coaches, guys, hopefully we can take everything on board tonight and apply it to our coaching sessions to make a more quality coaching sessions. Guys, over the coming days and weeks, enjoy your coaching. Enjoy being back out in the field. Enjoy with your players. And enjoy those games over the summer. And hopefully, Claire, we'll see them again over the summer period. So on that note, on behalf, on behalf of myself and, and Claire Dowell, we say thank you very much to everyone. Thank you. Thanks, folks. Bye.